turn to Acts 23. <clears throat> we'll continue our journey. Uh, so, sometimes you, you start thinking, will we ever? Will we ever? But I mean, we are, we are in uh, approaching the final quarter. And, uh, and we, we, you know, it, what's, what's slower than football last quarter time? Uh, Pastor Thad preaching last quarter. Uh, that's, that's slower. Um, but, but we are moving and we, and again, uh, the, the point isn't that we don't have anything else to teach. Um, you gotta remember, I've, I've been used to teaching, uh, three times a week. Um, and, and, uh, now I, I, I teach twice. And if I'm on a series on Sunday mornings and I've got acts going on, on, uh, Sunday nights or on Wednesday nights, uh, there's not a lot of other stuff that I can do. I, is, I, I I'm limited. And, and so, so this, this is not one of those things that I'm doing just because I don't have things to preach. I mean, I've got a backlog of things to preach. Uh, but, uh, but I believe that we're still pulling out so many truths and so many insights. Uh, even last week, just in talking about that pure conscience and being led by your conscience and allow your conscience to direct you in the spirit of the Lord. Um, you never underestimate the power of that. Uh, we're we're going to talk about that in a second here a little bit. But let's go ahead and read these first few uh, few verses uh, and get going. It says, And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And, and the high priest Ananias uh, commanded them that stood by him to punch him in the mouth. Um, then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou white wall, uh, thou white wall, uh, whited wall, for sittest thou there to judge me after the law and command and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? And then they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? Then said Paul, I didn't realize, I didn't know that he uh, was the high priest, brethren, uh, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. And then he took, uh, he took, Concept, he, he took a view of what the room was. The Lord gave him direction. Uh, but last week we, we, we held out in that area a little bit just about the, the, the importance of your conscience. Uh, if you remember the series I preached, uh, I, I preached it probably a couple different times, um, Divine Order. And, uh, and a lot of people love to sit there and go, Divine Order, Divine Order, Divine Order. They'll preach Divine Order. Um, but the first place the man comes into divine order uh, is number four, uh, and and uh, and and ever and, and if that's the only place that you're preaching divine order uh, is number four, I think you're missing it uh, because number one is God Himself, and that, and and, and uh, number one and number two operate. I mean, honestly, it's it's one A one B because number one is God Himself. Number two is is the the authority of truth or the word. Which again, Scripture says God has put His word above His name. So the word could actually be one. God could be actually number two, which is weird. And I know religion doesn't like that, but that's what God said. Uh, but the third one is the authority of conscience. In other words, God has placed in each and every one of us a, a conscience to do right and wrong, and and uh, and it's an authority. It's it's the authority. If if a man comes along and tries to get you to go against the authority of your conscience. It's it's not something you should be listening to. I think next week, or the week after that, I, I'm not sure how far we'll get tonight. Um, we'll, we're going to be dealing with uh, uh, basically honoring unspiritual or evil leadership, um, and uh, because that's exactly what was going on here. Paul was right in his assessment of the situation. He was right in who Ananias was. But he was wrong in how he did it, and and, uh, and so uh, so we'll see that. But beloved, your conscience is God given. God placed it in every person in the in the world. You don't get saved. Uh, you know, I, I one of the one of the scriptures I didn't get to this last week was in uh, in Romans chapter eight. Uh, I, I mentioned it. I think I mentioned it, uh, but I was going to talk a little bit about it anyway. Uh, that. Uh, um, that Romans chapter eight is, is is just simply basically when you're born again, the Holy Spirit becomes your conscience. The Holy Spirit becomes your guiding post when you get born again. 
So, so it is essential that we listen to the Holy Spirit. What's so important about listening to the Holy Spirit, slash, backslash, forward slash, I don't know, our conscience. Um, if, if you go back, to, you, you might still be in Romans chapter, I don't know, or have your thumb there. Uh, but it says to be carnally minded is, is death. But to be spiritually minded or m- your mindset on the things of the Spirit, God directing you, God telling you don't do that, you don't do it, telling you to do it, you do it, you do do it, um, is life and peace. It's Zoe life and shalom. Which means, again, Zoe life means living like God lives. If we will learn to follow the conscience and the Spirit of the, of the Lord speaking to us in that still small voice, some people say, I don't know what the... I don't know what the Spirit of God sounds like. Well, how many times in your life have you had something bad happen and afterwards you said, I knew I shouldn't have done that. I knew I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, you heard the voice. You just didn't pay attention to the voice. You went contrary to the voice. And what did it do? It produced an area of death or frustration in your life. Now you say, you say well, I didn't know that if that was God or if that was... If that was, that was your conscience, but what happens is the more you listen to the conscience, the more more you familiar, familiarize yourself with that, the louder that voice becomes, the clearer that voice becomes. <laughs> um, has anybody ever had a? I I, I forget who it was, but uh, you, you ever been around somebody that is very poor in how they talk? Maybe there's somebody that you're, they're just not clear in how they talk. They mumble or they say things. Babies can be that way. Toddlers can be that way when they're learning. They'll say things in a way. And, and if they're not your kid or if that's not your parent or someone like that, not your relative, not someone you spend a lot of time with, uh, you find yourself going, okay. Are looking to some, can somebody interpret for them, Right? The more you stay around them, the more you're around them, you're the one that you can converse with them and understand what they're saying, even though others can't hear the, what you're hearing. Does that make sense? That's the way it is with the Holy Spirit. I'm not calling him a toddler, but I'm saying that when you don't know his voice or when you're not around his voice, it becomes harder to detect when he's talking or when, or when he's not talking. But the more you're around him, the more you're listening to him, and the more you, you understand uh, how he words things. You're familiar with the Word. You're familiar with that kind of stuff. The more you're in tune with uh, the Spirit and, and, and you understand it clearer. The reason most people don't know, don't know the voice of the Spirit is because they've not obeyed it when they heard it. Amen. Amen. Um, but but I, that, that's the only Scripture I'm going to share at this time. But it's just simply when you listen to the flesh part of you that is trying to get you to usurp the the areas of authority, the godly areas of authority, then it's going to produce frustration in your life, anxiety in your life, destruction in your life. Now, when you're when you're following the voice of the Spirit, the enemy loves to come, just like Pastor Elisa said. And condemn you and try to get you to stop it. It's stupid. Why would you do that? Why would you give that amount of money? Why would you give in this place? Why don't you hold on to it? Why don't you? Why don't you not do that? Take some time off. Quit doing that. And and, and, and tries to convince you of that because he wants you to fail. But your familiarity with the voice, the familiarity with the word. Amen. So. Uh, so again, that, that is was so important. I talked about it more last week. Now let's go ahead and move on. Now we're going to go ahead and uh, dissect, and we're gonna, we'll get as far as we can tonight, uh, uh, verses two through five, where uh, where the apostle Paul is had at, at a at a corresponding at some level with the high priest Ananias. Uh, verse 2, it says, Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. And again, that word smite is not, I, I just kind of always have pictured a slap. It, it, even, even so, when my kids were little, and if they would say something or they'd mouth off to us, which they didn't do a lot, but if they did, um, or if they mouth off to us, or if they, uh, uh, I don't know, said something they shouldn't or whatever, 
we just did a little thing where we reached over to their mouth. And we, I mean, it wasn't something that was going to uh, floor them. And we, weren't, we weren't slugging them. We just do that because, you know, when someone does that to your mouth, you realize, okay, I shouldn't have said it. It's, it's a very clear thing. That's how I always kind of figured is that that or even just a slap on the face. Uh, this was this was a, a matter of fact, the, the word, if you look up that word in, in the Greek, it means to thump, to pummel or repeated blows. So this means the guy probably closed his fist and laid into him, possibly more than once. Uh, it, it could have it could have been a couple of times, which would have hurt. So it made me mad, too. Um, but uh, but but the smack is obviously an overflow of the anger of, at Paul. They're, they're already ticked off because they had to show up in the morning for a council meeting, an unscheduled one. Remember, they're getting ready for a festival, getting ready for uh, the, the feast, and, and, and so that's what they're thinking about. And now they have to meet together to, to not even try. This wasn't illegal. This was like a show up, guys, and they showed up. And that's why the high priest very possibly wasn't in his priestly robes uh, when, when Paul didn't quite understand who he was and talked back to him. Uh, he he wasn't, maybe wasn't even in his priestly robes. This was a hurried together thing. Paul hadn't spent time uh, familiarizing himself. Who's in charge now? Who's that? This was something that night. He, the, the, uh, the soldiers, uh, the Roman soldiers were uh, fearful for their lives. The next, they're, they're like, we're meeting you next morning. They get the they get the uh, Sanhedrin together the next morning. That's what they're going. That's, that's what they're going to take care of uh, that morning. And so so uh, so this he's kind of annoyed at that. He's annoyed at Paul. Everybody was annoyed at Paul. Paul was as good as they had as a Pharisee, and and now he had been stealing from their kingdom. Again, I mean, I, I'm not saying, you know, but well, the worst thing when somebody quits your church and goes to another. Is especially if they're a giver, is that other church you, you you spend all the time teaching them how to give, and that our church now gets all their money. It's kind of annoying. Well, that's what the Jews were most concerned with. I, that's not what I'm most concerned with. I love I love you, and when you leave, it, it when they not when you when they people leave, it tears at me. It hurts me deep. Uh, that and, and but that's not what I'm worried about. But uh, but what they're worried about was money. They loved money, especially Ananias. And we'll talk about that in just a second. And so, so when every person that got born again went over to the church and they were longer tithes to the temple. That, would, that bothered them. That bothered them. This was not something... Paul had done too much to hurt their religion. Um, but he didn't... He And he considered... And then Paul had just got done saying, my conscience is clear. And, and after doing all these heinous things that he's been doing, pre preaching about Jesus, uh, teaching against the law. And again, remember, that's what, they, that's what they were lying about, was that Paul would tell them the law was no longer important, that was no longer necessary. I kind of liked what, uh, uh, what, what, what Pastor Mike taught on Sunday morning, the offering is that, Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. Uh, so, and and that's kind of what Paul was. Like. Paul was. I've never said that if you want to, if you want to, uh, if you want to do animal sacrifice, that's fine. That's just not where your salvation is. If you want to circum get circumcised, that's fine. That's just not where your salvation comes from. And that's all he's saying. Well, that 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 is like you can't stand there and tell me you got a clear conscience doing what you're doing, and just made him mad. So he's mad at him because of the early morning. He's mad at him for that. And it also, and this, this struck me, and I thought it was interesting with, with, with Pastor Lisa bringing up uh, uh, Romans chapter 1. I think very likely it could have been the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Because a lot, the conviction of the Holy Spirit will do one of two things. It will promote change or it will make you mad. How many have ever gotten mad at their pastor? You don't raise, don't raise your hand. Because pastor preached on the tithe again. And you're not tithing. And pastor has no right to preach on the tithe. Maybe it's bothered you to all get up. Or you're just, you're just, 
I can't believe he's preaching on that again. He's talking about sowing again. I don't want to sow. I, I, I sow. I'll sow as much as I can. That five bucks is as much as I can. And which I, I've never said how much you have to sow. I just say so. Uh, you know, but I can't believe he's preaching on it again. Why do we have to preach on offering every single service? And, and they're going to talk about the tithe. They're going to talk about the giving. because and, and what ends up happening is that the conviction is on you. Now notice here, it does not say in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, that there, there is therefore now no condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are walking in the Spirit and not according to the flesh. In other words, if you're walking in your flesh and doing the things that you want to do, guess what there is? Even if you're a child of God, you will feel crummy. See, conviction of the Holy Spirit is simply convincing. In other words, the Holy Spirit goes, got it? You know, he'll, he'll put it in your heart, yeah, I need to be doing that. That's what conviction is. Conviction isn't making you feel two feet tall. It's just simply saying, this is why you do what you do. And, and the truth hits you in the heart. You've been convicted. You've been, you've, you've been convinced of the truth. Now you change the way you're doing it. Condemnation pushes you down. Now, God's not bringing the condemnation. Your flesh is bringing the condemnation. There is condemnation, and I know this. You say, are you telling me, a Pastor Pastor Lisa? No, no, I'm not. Pastor, what Pastor Lisa said was 110 percent true. I mean, it was absolutely true. But the point I'm trying to bring out is, when you're not walking according to the Spirit, you'll feel crummy about what you're not doing. And again, what God's saying is that don't feel crummy about it. Let's just do it. What about all those years I didn't do it? We're not talking about all those years. We're talking about from here on out. Let's just do it. But here's the point. Is that convictions is either going to lead you to change or it's going to lead you to anger and frustration and offense. Offense at God. Offense at the man of God. Offense at what you what, what what you read that brought you the conviction. I how how often I don't know how many of you listen to Bill Johnson, but how often listen to Bill Johnson are you convicted? You know when he starts talking about the things they're doing, I'm like, yes, that's what we we yeah yeah we gotta get going get moved. Yeah. And now now if you can keep if you hear if you're hearing the same message. Two years later, and you still haven't started. That's when you start feeling crummy about it. Got to get moving. Just got to get moving. Um, Charles Spurgeon says it like this, and, and, and you know I've, I, I say I say something similar to this. Um, but the same sun that melts wax hardens clay. The same gospel that melts some persons to repentance hardens others in their sins. The best illustration of this in Scripture is Pharaoh uh, in, in Exodus when, they, when the children of Israel were getting ready to leave. And, and God is moving. God's power is moving. And, and, uh, and, and everybody is like, why are we holding on to these slaves? That If this is what their God's doing, I mean, they're, he's, bringing, he's bringing toads. And again, if you've ever had an infestation of something, um, you kind of get an idea if it's maybe fleas. I remember when we were down in Texas, uh, the family that there was a family that uh, was moving out of their house. They were going to rent their house to us, and and, uh, and and we were like grateful. And but they had several dogs that ran through the house, and so when the dogs aren't there anymore, the fleas stay. It's just that they got to find something else to jump on. So I had my I had my office in in the in, in the house and. I would I would be sitting at my desk in my you know my shorts and my t-shirt, be sitting at my desk doing something, and I just feel these things hitting my leg, just jumping on my legs. I'd be like, Rah! I don't know how many times we treated carpet and treated everything because uh, we should have just gotten an animal and just let the fleas go crazy on the animal. But if you've had an infestation, you understand how annoying that is. Well, I mean, there was literally an infestation of of frogs and of locusts. I mean, we're not talking about they just had 150 of them going throughout the town. We're talking literally their streets were full of them. 
And, uh, and it, was, it was insane. And where God was moving, it made the Israelites go, God's alive and He's moving on our behalf. And their hearts would melt under the presence of God. And Pharaoh would buckle down and say, no, you ain't leaving anymore. And he would make their jobs harder. The same God that will touch one person. My dad has always said it like this. The same sun that hardens clay melts butter. And that same God who will get a hold of a person and bring them to a place of tears and just of intimacy with Him and love on Him and cause them to change their whole life. He's taken hardened bikers and drug users and and changed them into... uh, Puddles of butter. That same God, when He shows that power to the heathen, they just get angry because they think, well, you're trying to give me rules. We're trying to make rules. And and I, I heard it again the other day. What do I have to give up to be a Christian? If I'm going to be a Christian, what do I have to give up? And the guy goes, nothing. What? What? How can that be? If you come to Jesus... He will change you from the inside out. He will convict you. He will talk to you. He will lead you into all truth. But you've got to to listen to Him. Over in... uh, See, see, and and we talked a little bit about this last week. When you begin ignoring what God's doing, your heart will be seared. And then instead of responding to what you are seeing with God, you begin reacting with anger and offense. Uh, Go over to Mark chapter 12, verse 6. And I'm just going to, um, I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to read out the message translation, John. Hallelujah. That's, that's why the, that's why the Holy Spirit tells us, keep your hearts. Uh, What does it say in Proverbs? Guard your heart with all diligence. Don't let it get hard. Don't let it get to that place where when you get corrected. Are you a person that, now now your pastor, uh, you're safe, and most of you are safe in this, is not a person that goes out and starts just correcting you willy-nilly. I'm not. But are you a person that if your pastor came and corrected you, would it melt you? Or would it harden you, make you mad at it? Because again, we can get into that. We can get into that point. We can get into that circle of victory where we begin understanding how do we hear the voice of God? We hear the voice of God through His Word. We hear the voice of God through His Spirit. We hear the voice of God through the men and women of God that God has placed in our lives. Are you gonna? I, I had. I there was a kid in my youth group. Uh, in 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 well, just in the first place I was a youth pastor at, and um, and I came to him one time and I said, "You need to watch that." And he looked at me and said, don't be ridiculous. That's, that's silly. I'm okay. There's no big deal. I said, okay. And I didn't, I didn't correct him anymore. And I just watched him get further into trouble and deeper into trouble. And, um, I mean, he had a good, I guess he had a pretty rough reputation uh, behind the scenes because he didn't listen to his pastor. And what happened when you didn't, he didn't listen to his pastor? His pastor just said, okay. But, but in the message translation, uh, Jesus is responding to the Pharisees who were angry at the disciples because they went on the Sabbath and, and were hungry. And they picked, I don't understand how it is, but they picked some wheat off, uh, some grains of wheat off, and they're rubbing it in their hands somehow so they could eat it. That's all I know. That's what the Bible says. And, and the Pharisees saw that they picked some things off of a tree. And you ain't supposed to do that on the Sabbath. You can't work on the Sabbath. What are you doing on the Sabbath? You can't do that. And as they're picking it off, off, their, uh, off the grain, as they're picking it off, they got called on. They said, how dare you? you you're honoring the Sabbath. You, 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 know, you say you're, you're spiritual and all that kind of stuff. You're not honoring the Sabbath. You're not going to do all that kind of stuff. And Jesus' answer was this in verse 6. And the message just, just makes it really clear and sweet. It says, there is far more at stake here than religion. If you had any idea what this scripture meant, um, 
that, and, and again, in the King James, it's different, but he said that I prefer a flexible heart to an, infle- in an inflexible ritual. You wouldn't be nitpicking out of all these things. God is a God who is after your heart. Keep your heart tender. Keep your heart from allowing bitterness in. You know, when, the, when, 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 when my dad passed away, a couple of years, two years ago now, um, and, and, and immediately people that, that man, they, they said they were my friends. They acted like my friends. They pretended like they were my friends, I guess, for years. Began just shutting me out. Just treating me, not even as a, as a co-pastor, underneath that. And it, might, it was my dad's ministry. And my dad told me three months previously that it was his ministry and that he believed that it should be. He didn't know how to handle it because I was here, but he, but, uh, but he, he knew that I should have it. Again, I, I don't And so that's how they treated me. They treated me horrible. They still are treating me horrible. Um, but the whole, I, 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 the first about five months of that, of, after that, I would ask the Lord things and it was like, it, 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 honestly, it was like I was talking to my best friend. The communication was so clear, so open. Um, and, and he, he would, he just told me, keep your, the first thing he told me, keep your heart clean, keep your hands clean, and keep your nose clean. But the first thing he says, keep your heart clean. Don't allow the things that they've done. Don't allow the things that they've, they've gone after you with. Don't allow that stuff to change your heart. Because once your heart gets bad, it's really hard to hear. He told me a couple of other things very clear. And, 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 you know, I'll come back to it every now and then. I say, Lord, any other news? And, and it's kind of like, no, it's, it's still, it's still there. You, you, you got it. But your, your, your beloved, when it comes to here, Ananias is now. Now there's other problems with Ananias, but he's he's seen, he's heard the stories of what Paul's done. He sees Paul in front of him, and 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 Paul does lash out at him. There's no doubt there, but his response to him very likely could have been conviction of the Holy Spirit that said he's right. Again, is that not what Paul said when he said, when, when Jesus, told, when, when God told him, don't go, and he said, but I gotta go. I gotta go. Let me go there and win these people. They, they, I was like them. I, I operated like them. That's exactly what his thought. They'll be convinced. No. Because their response to the conviction was hostility. Anger. Amen. Now, um, so Paul lashes out at him. And it's clear he lashes out at him. I read one commentator that said that he wishes he could have heard uh, Paul's tone so that he could have really understood uh, when when Paul said, um, uh, uh, when, when Paul said that, uh, you know, smite God, smite thee, you white-walled, uh, why did wall you sit as men and judge me and you're breaking the law? All that guys. He wished he could have heard his tone to know if he was calm and just and just kind of was like uh, was like here uh, you smack me and you know and, and calm and, and composed or if it was just an outburst of anger. I, I believe it was somewhere in between. Honestly, I don't think it was anger though. It could have there could have been some flesh. You get you get punched in the mouth. Uh, what, I think Mike Tyson has a quote that says, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. You know, when you get punched in the mouth, all your planning goes out. You just start street. Well, so, I mean, literally, I mean, he, he's like, he's like, I stand here. Uh, I stand here with a clear conscience and all I've done. And he goes, stop it. Hit that man. He pops him in the, in the mouth. And, and he, he's like, you, and, and, and it could have been, it could have been hot. I do not believe it was calm, uh, because that doesn't really fit Paul too much. It could have been. It could have been. But, but, um, it, it, he, I believe it was strong, for lack of a better word. It's stern. It was the head tilt. 
it was said, um, don't you ever. You follow me on that? Now, now it's clear, uh, a little bit, I think verse 5, or verse 4, where he says, revilest thou the high priest of the man of God? That word revile means to debase, to degrade, or to make vile or shame. So it wasn't clean. It wasn't done in love. And it wasn't gentle. It wasn't calm. I believe that very much. Um, and, and, and I believe that we can easily see that it was probably done a little bit dirty. That, that, that he was striking out. I don't think he was yelling because he knows what was acceptable in the chambers, in, in, the, in the council room. He spent many times there. Um, now remember, he was not wrong. In what he said. He said you are a whited wall. Which means whitewashed. Simply meaning that means to cover up a wall. That has, it has obvious flaws. And you just slap a big coat. Slap a coat of paint on it. You'll be fine. So you're, you're, there's a wall that, it, that is fragile. That is flawed. That is hurt. That is damaged. And we're just going to slap a coat of paint on it. And it'll be okay. That's, that's literally what you're saying. He said underneath. All this picture of being a high priest, you're ugly. You're dirty. And he was. Ananias was very two-faced. He was not a good man. He was known, and this is not good if you're a man of God. He was known for his greed. Now if you'll remember, the, the, the high priest office was very much to be bought back in Jesus' times, in, in those times. The high priest position, because it was the wealthiest position. All the people in Israel would tithe to the priests. And there's lots of priests. All of them would tithe to the priest. And then the priest would all tithe to the high priest. So the high priest was the richest man in Israel. And so everybody wanted to be the high priest. And so Rome took over responsibilities for it, and it became something that they sold to the highest bidder. So if you gave them enough money, they would, they would do that. And, and so that's why, I mean, he was known for his greed. That's why he wanted it. And he was, if I remember correctly, I didn't write this down, but I believe he was high priest for about eight years, give or take. Which was a long time to be. That's why some people say, I don't think, I don't think, I think he had just become the high priest. And he had, he had been, a matter, matter of fact, he was well in the middle of, of it being high priest. So, um, uh, but he's known for his greed. He was known to wield great influence in lawless, violent ways. So the, the government meant nothing to him. He would break the laws easily. He would use violence and assassination to further his career. I say, yeah, he, he was not a good man. Um, Josephus wrote, just love that name, wrote that he was known. Now remember, all the, all the tithes of the people are coming to the priests. Every priest, every Levite would tithe to the high priest. And and so he was loaded. And, um, and he was known, what, one of the things that he was known for is stealing or dipping in to the tithe that belonged to the other priests. So they would tithe to him and then he would go and clean out, you know, buckets and all that kind of stuff that they had around there and take it to him for himself. He was not a good man. So when Paul was like, you're a whited wall, you're a whitewashed wall, you're, you're gross. You, you're presenting something exterior, but you're ugly underneath. Paul, I, I don't think Paul knew Ananias. I don't think Ananias was around 20 years previously when Paul was around. I, I, don't, I don't believe that. He may have been, but he may have been young at that time. But man, is he on target. Man, is he reading this guy's mail. So Paul was right, but you know what? He was wrong too. And we will, we will, we'll cover that probably next week or the week after that. But he's, but he says, um, 
<laughs> he says the, uh, that, that you're, you sit us there to judge me after the law, but command me to be smitten contrary to the law. The law, and, and remember the, the, the law, they had the Ten Commandments, and then they had the book of the law that was not what God wanted us to follow. It's what they did to make sure they did. They, they, how are we going to honor the Sabbath? Let's do 600 billion uh, uh, laws to honor the Sabbath. Uh, you can you can let your donkey out to go get, but you can't lead him or whatever. You can't get him out of a pit. You, I mean, they had all these little stupid variations of it. Um, and, and, but in this law, they had, and and some of the law, I guess some of the law was based on in Exodus, um, because in Exodus, I think it's Deuteronomy twenty five. Uh, the uh, it says that in order to strike a man, he's got to be found guilty first. So if you strike a man and he's not guilty, then you're guilty. I mean, literally, so I think Deuteronomy 25, 1 and 2. So the, 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 the Jewish law made it very clear that he that strikes a man, a man strikes the Holy One. I mean, that's how they viewed it. He who strikes the cheek of an Israelite strikes as it were the glory of God. I love that. He who strikes the cheek of an Israelite. We're New Testament Israelites, aren't we? We're children of God. We, 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 are, we are His children. But he who strikes the cheek of an Israelite strikes as it were the glory of God. And we know that we are the glory of God. Go over to Ephesians real quick here. I, I just I like this. The wording here. Uh, I was really confident that I wasn't. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, three. Ephesians 3. <clears throat> oh, that's, that's all so good. But let's just go down to verse 20. It says, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church. His church. His gathering of bricks, lockheads. His gathering of, of, of Christian of, of, of souls are his glory. You and I are his glory. <clears throat> and I love the point where they say, where it just simply says, if you strike them, you are striking the glory of God. And of course, it didn't take Pastor Thad very much to, to go into the to, to Psalm 105, verse 15, where it says, touch not mine anointed. <clears throat> Excuse me. Pastors have used that. That is not meant for a manipulation. Um, it's not. That's not pastors keeping his people. Don't mess with me. Don't question. Don't question if I'm doing something right. Don't question me. Don't touch God's anointed. Pastors have used that for years to try to control their people. It's not manipulative. Because if you carry the Spirit, you carry the anointing. Everyone in this room that's a child of God is the anointed, is, is our anointed ones. <clears throat> um, uh, go, go to uh, Matthew 1. Uh, let's go to 17. This is one of the really cool things uh, in, in Scripture. We miss it because we usually skim over this part. Um, <clears throat> the beginning of it says, Bob begat Jim, and Jim begat Steve, and Steve begat Adam, and you, you know how it goes. It starts with Abraham, right? Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob. And it goes through, and, 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 and verse 17, <clears throat> it says, So all the generations from um, Abraham to David are 14 generations. If you go back to verse 2 and you begin counting, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, you go on from there. Um, 
you get, you get 14. You count up 14 generations. And then he says, and from David until the carrying away of Babylon are 14 generations. You, go, you list that from, uh, from verse 6, David, count on down to the carrying away of 14 generations. And then it says, and from the carrying away of Babylon until Christ, 14 generations. You start reading from the carrying away of Babylon the same way until you get to Christ, it's 13. 13 generations. The Bible's wrong, Pastor Thad. The Bible's wrong. I, I think it was John Avanzini who made this statement. He said, when we understand what, the, what, what, what Christ is, Christ is the anointed one, the anointing he operates under, and the anointed ones that operate under that anointing. And so the point is, is that Christ Jesus was 13. We are that chosen generation. We are the culmination from Abraham to Jesus. We are the culmination of generations in the lineage of Jesus. We are it. We are that 14th generation. It's you and I. We are that anointed ones. The same anointing that ran through that bloodline is running through us. And so when God begins to talk to us and says, don't touch my anointed. When you strike, when you... Listen, just say it like this, people. If you're messing with people that are the glory of God, you're messing with God. When you go up against people or you start telling secrets or telling, telling lies or truth about people, or you're, or you're just or you're berate, berating them and belittling them. You are messing with the very glory of God. You are messing with His anointed ones. And it is not acceptable. I believe that there's pastors out there that are doing it wrong. It's not my job to preach on them or, or, or play the, uh, name their names. It's not mine. If they're doing it wrong, my job is to preach the truth, not to take them down. You say, well, then they're not anointed they're, if they're doing it wrong. Maybe they're doing seven things right, one thing wrong. The one thing wrong is what everybody sees. How, much, how, much, how many attacks does Joel Osteen make? I get, how many attacks does he have come against him? It, it, it's it, yeah. We goes like can't count that high pastor. I know. What, what, and what do they attack him about? Oh, they 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 will attack him, you know, because maybe he said something in an interview that wasn't perfect or whatever, whatever uh, that he isn't. They they maybe attack him because his preaching isn't isn't deep. Well, he do, he doesn't want it to be deep. The, the the teaching that he puts on TV, he doesn't want to be overly deep. He wants to be encouraging. He gets in deep with his people during the week. He's reaching the multitudes. He's reaching the, the, the heathen that are home too. So I could stand, I could stand up here and I could, because there's some things that I'm not, I'm not too sure about Joel Osteen. But you'll never hear me say a bad word about him because that's not my job. And My job is to love. My job is to not touch God's anointed. I, I Stephen Furtick, another one that people love to argue with, uh, put down. Listen, I don't know that I would want to sit in his church. I. I've heard some of his messages, and he has amazing messages, amazing object lessons, amazing things. I, 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 his songwriting, extraordinary. Um, you know, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna put him or Bill Johnson up against each other, I'm gonna go to Bill Johnson's church. I enjoy that deepness. But Stephen Furtick is not wrong per se. So is it my job? I've not, I wasn't called. I wasn't called to do what Bill Johnson does. I, was, I, I, I shouldn't say, I wasn't called to do what Stephen Furtick does. 
I was called to do what Thad Callahan was called to do. And so I can get so caught up in what I've been called to do that when I look at other places, I can, I can be loaded down with a lot of critique, condemnation, attacks. They shouldn't do that. They, shouldn't, they should do things like me. Lord, Lord told me one time, he said, there's some churches, some pastors I'm using just to get people through the doors of the church. And I've got other pastors that, that, that once they realize there's more, they'll find them. Beloved, we've got to guard ourselves. Uh, think, think about, um, and, and again, if you just do what God tells you to do, God takes care of your, your details. It's amazing to me how many people online feel like they have to tear other people down. How many negative words did, did I say, uh, did, what came out of my mouth about Asbury Revival? I'm saying, no, you didn't ever say anything bad, you know. No, I did have a couple curiosity points. But I'm like, my goodness, if God's moving, if, if, if you've got, you got a thousand students worshiping God and they're drawing people, other students in, my goodness, let it go. If it's not of God, it will burn up. It is not our job to sit there and put, put uh, videos online to try to explain why, well, they let women teachers in there and they let this in there and, and this is not of God because God would lead to God. A uh, move of God would move to God, not to the Holy Spirit. They, and it's all you're doing is spewing your vile doctrinal concepts. Our job is to protect one another. We are the glory of God. And the same way you don't sit there and, and go, you know, you, you got a, you got a bulb in your ceiling and you don't come and you don't, you know, start smacking it with things every time you walk by. You go through a lot of bulbs. You just let that bulb shine. And if it's not a right kind of bulb, it'll burn out. Are you with me here? Beloved, that's, that's, see, I mean, I, I was thinking in terms of, remember when, uh, when Abra, Abraham, Abram, he, he goes to the land that God's going to show him, he sets up camp, then there's famine in the land, and so him and Sarai, they moved out, down to Egypt, and as they got to Egypt, uh, he goes, hey, I got a plan here. Stupid plan, dumb plan, wrong plan. So he was not right. He was not right. In other words, what we would say is that he was preaching something that was wrong. What well, was he preaching? You're going to organize like you're my sister. Just so that they don't hurt me. And he got, he got into Egypt and, Pharaoh, and somebody pointed at her and Pharaoh goes, I don't want her part, part of my hair. And, and so, so Pharaoh loads him with animals and all this kind of stuff and, and takes his wife. Abram's wrong. But because, and this would, this would, if you, if you, in chapter 20, that was chapter, this is chapter 12, chapter 20, something similar happens, and this doesn't happen, but it tells me Pharaoh touched her. Touch not mine anointed. It tells me Pharaoh touched her, someone touched her in the house. And what happened? A major plague fell on that house. In chapter 20, very similar things happen with Abimelech. And, 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 and God visits him in the dream and says, don't touch. Don't touch my anointed. And his house was saved. Beloved, whether you agree with people or don't agree with people, it's not our job to judge people. It's our job to love people. I was thinking about the scripture in Matthew 25 where it says, whatever you do to the least of my brother, you've done it unto me. And I know the visit in prison, the orphan, all that kind of stuff. But if you think about how many people have you treated not on a high order that are children of God. 
See, whether you like it or not, you are treating God that same way. You were treating, you, you, you treated somebody, a child of God, with disrespect because they don't know what they're talking about. They don't, and maybe you're rude or you're, you're, you're nasty to them. You treated God that way. Well, they're not very mature and they were wrong. Mm-hmm. So, so was Pharaoh and so, so was Abraham, but God protected him. We got to guard ourselves. When we, if we are, we are the glory of God, not just pastors and ministers, but all of us. And we need to love one another. We need to take care of one another. We need to watch over one another. We need to take responsibility for one another. Not just for their benefits, but for our benefit. Amen. Got, get it? I, I know those things, you know, they're, but they're things that you don't necessarily talk about a lot. I, I just the last, just the last couple of things that we talked about today um, are just not things that we do talk about a lot. But beloved, you got to guard yourself. What about the what about the ladies that wear the long dresses everywhere they go? You know how many how many weird words or how many thoughts did you have? That would like uh, like they're they're dumb. They're just idiots. They're trying to serve God. They may not have, be li- liberated like you're liberated. They're just they're just trying to serve God. They they've been told you got to wear a dress. Be glad be glad that somebody's willing to wear it on the outside too. A lot of Christians aren't willing to wear anything on the outside. I'm not saying doing naked. I'm saying I'm saying. They're not willing to walk out their Christianity on the outside. It's not our job to judge. Amen. Next week we'll we'll start in that area, and we got a couple other areas to to talk about in that, um, because I, I think it's I think it's, it, it'll it'll flow from this, but I, I just don't dare get into it because uh, it's 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 another good area. It's another good area that will challenge us. Amen. Uh, so let's stand together. Let's stand together. So we just got to guard ourselves, guard our hearts, guard your heart with all diligence. Don't let the enemy put a- hatred, anger, bitterness. Don't let it. Don't let it happen. And don't let it happen. You, you've got you've got too much at stake. You got too much seed in the ground. You got too many promises to let it stop because how you treat somebody else, or because just the bit, a bitter, stingy heart. Amen. Highly. Heavenly Father, we love you. I thank you for your word. I trust that this word was, uh, yes, I know it was challenging. And sometimes you get challenging words you can feel. You can walk away feeling condemned, feeling like Pastor Thad rang us through the, uh, put, put us through the ringer. Uh, but that's not, that's, no, it's just that, that encouragement of, of guarding ourselves. If there's something that we're doing wrong, if we've had some thoughts towards other pastors and other churches and other Christians, that, that's not our job. That's not our job. Our job is to do what God has called us to do. And the most important thing you can call us to do is to love one another. And so, Father, I pray that we will guard our hearts, that we will keep a guard over it, a keep over it, to not let the enemy put, put dangerous, gross things in to steal, kill, and destroy from us. We love you, Father. We love you. In Jesus' name.